just last night, I was talking about my own struggles with identity and how I struggle with feeling insecure. My girl's eyes kind of lit up like, what, mom, you struggle with feeling insecure? And so I said, you know, your dad's helping me grow. And I shared a little bit about how when I feel insecure, um, their dad, my husband, reminds me of who I am in Christ. And, and that's where their eyes kind of got big. Hey, welcome. This is Family Life Blended, and I'm Ron Deal. This is a donor-supported podcast that helps blended families and those who love them pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm so glad you've joined us in the journey. This is episode number 86, Bipolar Value Differences between homes. Now that's an intriguing title. <laughs> hey, did you know you could submit questions to us? Even call in and leave a message that we might use on the podcast? Well, you can. The show notes will tell you how you can do that. We'd love to hear from you. In case you didn't know, kids have questions too. Well, that was stupid. Every parent knows kids have questions, right? They have big questions, as a matter of fact, and the older they get, the more important those questions become. Life-altering questions, as a matter of fact, and how you and the other home answer them really matters. But what if your value-based responses are different from the other homes? Bipolar, opposite answers, as a matter of fact. What do you do then? Well, that's our subject for today's episode of Family Life Blended. And it's just in time, too, because Erica wrote to us with a question saying that she is a faithful listener who's attended our summit on Step Family Ministry. She's very grateful for the care that we provide to blended families like hers. But her problem is that her former husband is living a very different lifestyle than hers. She says, my two children, 13 and 8, are being raised in a Christian home and attending church when they're with me and seeing a worldly home when they're at their dad's house. I would love to hear an episode, she says, dealing with bipolar value differences between homes. Well, Erica, that's exactly what we're doing today. Gayla Grace joins me in the studio again. She writes and speaks for Family Life Blended. She's the author of Step Parenting with Grace, a devotional for blended families, and co-author of Quiet Moments for the Stepmom Soul. Since 1995, she and her husband Randy have had a his, hers, and ours blended family. Dr. Kara Powell is the executive director of Fuller Youth Institute. She's also the chief leadership formation officer at Fuller Theological Seminary. She was named by Christianity Today as one of the 50 women to watch. She speaks regularly at parenting and leadership conferences and is the author or co-author of a number of books, including The Sticky Faith Guide to Your Family, Can I Ask That?, and Three Big Questions That Change Every Teenager?, which is the topic of this episode's conversation. Here's my conversation with Gayla Grace and Kara Powell. Gayla, it's always good to have you with me here in the studio. Thanks for being here. Sure. Good to be here, Ron. And we've got Kara Powell joining us from Southern California. Is that right? You're in Pasadena. Did I get that right? Absolutely. Yep. Pasadena, California, part of Los Angeles. Okay. Where you work and teach at Fuller Theological Seminary. Specifically, you work with the Fuller Youth Institute. For a long time, you guys have been studying faith development in children, among other things. Just at a quick high level, tell our listeners what you do day in and day out. Yeah, I'd be happy and honored to, Ron. Uh, well, I love research and I love young people. And so the mission of the Fuller Youth Institute is to turn research into practical resources that answer leaders and parents' toughest questions about young people's faith. So we at the Full Youth Institute, our amazing team, we get to stand with one foot in the world of uh, deep and important research and the other foot in the world of the real life questions of parents, step parents, and leaders. Um, and there's no place else I would rather stand. So mm. I'm also a parent myself. Uh, my husband and I have three kids who are 21, 19, and just turned 16. So I am very much mm. living the youth ministry life uh, <laughs> in my own family also. 
You, you know, one of the things I've loved about what I do in marriage and family ministry is I get to talk to myself all the time. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Like you as a mom, like for all these years, you've been studying how to try to help kids and you have them. And so you're talking to yourself, right? Absolutely. Then it gets real when it's uh, my own kids and we're wrestling with these questions. And my kids are funny. Every once in a while, something will be happening in our family and they'll look at me and say, Mom, you can't write about this. Um, so, you know, they, they, they've learned that. And I always ask their permission before I post any pictures or stories. But uh, yeah, it, it, I, I love actually the chance to test some of what we're learning in research and from other amazing families in my own family. So uh, there's a lot of reciprocal learning happening. That's for sure. Uh, well, that's pretty cool. Gayla, I know you've run into this too. <laughs> I have. And <laughs> you have so many stories that you have to filter through. Well, should I tell this one? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, me too. And what our audience doesn't know is all the great stories they will never hear. Exactly. <laughs> I know. So true. <laughs> well, that's okay. Well, we're going to tell them a few stories today. <laughs> so uh, if you're listening, I, just a forecast of where we're going, Care is going to be unloading for us some of the things they've learned about faith formation in uh, students and young adults. And boy, we're all invested and interested in this. If you've got kids, no matter what mm -hmm. age they are. Absolutely. And so we're going to be listening to some of that. And we're going to be talking about some of the complexities of blended families and how faith formation could be affected by structural changes in the family and the, the loss narrative and, and multiple households that are influencing children. We're going to get to that. But Kara, before we dive into that, you've got some blended family experience yourself. You mind just telling us a little bit about that? Yeah. Part of why I love being on this podcast is because of my own journey. My parents got divorced when I was about six. So I don't have a lot of memories of uh, being in the same home, living together with my mom and my dad. In fact, even just saying the words mom and dad together don't totally gel in my mind um, because both my parents got remarried. And so in my world, it was mom and Jim and dad and Helen, because um, mm -hmm. Jim and Helen were my are, were and are my two wonderful step parents. And so um, I, I think I have I have a lot of experience of being part of a blended family, um, some of the challenges of that, some of the ways that God has absolutely shaped me and shaped my character and my growth in the midst of that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about ha helping blended families today. So parents, step-parents, caregivers, grandparents listening to this podcast, I mean, we just want to help you and your family reach God's full potential for you. So I'm looking forward mm. to a meaty mm. and practical discussion. Well, I love that, and thanks for sharing. And absolutely, when we get to the, some of the complexities of being a blended family and how that impacts faith, if there's a story out of your own life that you just think of, um, we'd love to have you share some of that just because, or, you know, talking with the people, the, the youth ministers and the parents that you consult with over time. Absolutely. All that's really big. Okay. Speaking of big, your latest book, Three Big Questions That Every Teenager Needs to Figure Out and Answer in Their Life. Tell us a little bit about that project and what are the three big questions? Yeah, so my colleague and, and close friend Brad Griffin and I, we co-authored this book, Three Big Questions That Change Every Teenager, um, because we and the team at the Full Youth Institute, we love the questions that young people are asking. In fact, mm -hmm. in many ways, teenagers are just kind of walking bundles of questions. <laughs> um, and, you know, as parents or step-parents, we'll hear questions every day from our kids. You know, they're wondering questions about when they can hang out with their friends, you know, what kind of technology they can use, what the family's doing this weekend, et cetera. And what we wanted to do is in the midst of those, say, daily questions, we wanted to understand what are the questions beneath the questions? What are the questions that are really driving what a young person thinks about, their attitudes, their actions? And we were particularly motivated to do this research uh, because of what a 15-year-old told a youth pastor friend of ours. This 15-year-old said, I wish the church would stop giving me answers to questions I'm not asking. Hmm. I wish the church would stop giving me answers to questions I'm not asking. And I think 
The same is often true for us in our homes. Are, are we really sensitive to the questions that young people deep down are asking? And so we worked with a team of researchers. We, we uh, surveyed over 2,000 young people, and then we did deep dive interviews with 27 very diverse teenagers, spent four to six hours with each of those teenagers, not all in one city, um, <laughs> over a handful of conversations to really try to peel back the layers and understand what are the questions in the, in the driver's seat of the typical young person. Gayla, have you ever preached a sermon your kids weren't listening to? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Ooh. And the older they got, the more that seemed to happen. <laughs> as, she was, as Kara was talking, I was like, man, been there, done that. <laughs> Son, I got answers that you don't have questions for, but I'm going to tell you the answers anyway. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, sure. I, think, I think that's part of parenting. Isn't that part of the, you know, touch and go sort of, is this something that's helpful for my kid or is it not? Yeah. Like, you know, we have lots of questions too, I think. Well, and then yeah. I found as I got closer to leaving for college, you start going through this, you know, thing mm. in your head of, have I told them everything I need to tell them? And mm. then you just start, you know, downloading whether they're ready to hear it or not. <laughs> oh yeah. Gayla, I created a list because especially <laughs> for as each of our kids, our two olders have hit 12th grade. Like, yeah, all the things I wanted to make sure I talked to them about. So, <laughs> For sure. And I'm that's there. going to be her next book, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, quite possibly, quite possibly. <laughs> okay, so what are the three big questions? Yeah, so we think they boil down to identity, belonging, and purpose. So mm -hmm. let's unpack those questions a bit. Identity, who am I? Belonging, where do I fit? And purpose, what difference can I make? And, you know, those of us who are over 30, we're certainly wrestling with those questions, too. I mean, I would say identity, belonging, and purpose are, are just the three big questions of what it means to be human. But for those of us over 30, those questions are more at a low simmer. For teenagers and young adults, those questions are at a rolling boil. Um, and, uh, you know, I will say, as a parent myself, one of the big gifts of this research has been that, you know, if one of my kids is doing something that just seems a little off for them, like a little strange, uh, uh, something that just seems a little out of character, if I step back and ask, okay, you know, why are they so insistent on getting this time with their friends this weekend? Um, why, you know, why are they resisting whatever they might be resisting because they're hungry to make sure they get to church or whatever it is. Um, if I ask, okay, what are they after? Are they after identity? Are they after belonging? Are they after a sense of purpose? It's like the penny drops for me as a parent. And I all of a sudden understand, oh, that's what's motivating them. Um, that's why they're doing what they're doing. And it helps me empathize and, and know how to respond to them. Now, I don't say to my kids, you know, what you're really after is a sense of belonging. <laughs> like I don't say that aloud to them. <laughs> uh, although we do talk about identity, belonging, purpose, and I can share some of that, but you know, I don't, I, internally, I use it as kind of a diagnostic for me to understand, but in the heat of the moment, I don't generally share that aloud with my kids. So. Okay, I'm a little curious about the simmer versus the rolling boil. Yeah. Yeah, so is it a simmer for us that are over 30 because we've sort of figured a few things out, or is it somehow society is not pushing that at us as hard? Yeah, well, I'd say it's probably both. Um, okay. You know, that if you look at what developmental psychologists have said over the decades, they would say that, you know, identity, for instance, is kind of a quintessential question for young people. I think what's interesting, Ron, is um, it, it's in, I think, times of transition are when these questions heat up. So, you know, I have a friend who's actually uh, unemployed, was laid off from his job. Dave and I have a good friend. And, and you know, he, in his early 40s, he's wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the heat's being turned up on these questions for him about identity, belonging, and purpose because of being in the season of unemployment. Um, and if you think about teenagers and young adults, they're kind of in constant transition. So that's mm -hmm. why there's so much heat mm -hmm. under uh, about these issues for the, the young people we care about most is because they're in the middle of so many liminal or transitional seasons. 
And even more so in blended families. Mm. You think about the constant transition that these kids are going through. And so this is magnified what she is saying. Mm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm processing that thought. I think that's very insightful. There's so many changes and transitions, almost all of them unwanted. Right. And so it leaves you in a very different place and you start asking a whole new set of questions Mm -hmm. again in light of what's going on. What's a good example, Kara, of like that whole identity or belonging thing being a fresh question for a kid who's just gone through a a parent's marriage, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you mentioned belonging because that's what came to mind for me a few moments ago as as you and Gayla were talking, is uh, I have some wonderful psychology colleagues, some psychology faculty colleagues at, at Fuller Seminary. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them would say that belonging is actually uh, kind of the tip of the arrow of the three questions for the typical young person, that belonging kind of leads the way and has a unique influence on identity and purpose. And so, you know, think about that 12-year-old, that 15-year-old, that 17-year-old who is moving from one family situation to another family situation, whether, you know, their, their, their parents are going through a divorce or whether, as you've said, you know, there's a, a new parent, step-parent, and maybe even some new step-siblings that are coming into the family system, coming into the home. I think it it brings certainly new stressors when it comes to belonging, but also new opportunities to to create a new sense of family and a new sense of belonging in which everyone really feels at home. So, So again, these transition seasons are unique opportunities for us as adults to make sure that we're attentive to kids' needs and that we're helping them get what they need in terms of whether it's belonging or that sense of identity or that sense of purpose. Hmm. So that was really good because I was about to turn the corner and go, okay, so parents listening right now and they're just becoming very mindful of something going on in one of their child's lives. And so they're thinking, yeah, what do I do? How do I be helpful in this moment? Um, so how would they check in with a child around this type of thing. I mean, we talk a lot on this podcast about stepping into children's grief Mm -hmm. and bringing it up, not just sitting on it and expecting them to bring it up, but we sort of step into that space first to show them that we're willing to go there. I'm wondering how a parent would step into the belonging question. Yeah, would step in first? Yeah, or just how might they minister to their child? Yeah. Well, if we're talking about, say, uh, you know, a teenager, I I think there's something about the parent's own self-disclosure that's really powerful. In fact, just just last night uh, with my husband and our two daughters, because our our college daughter is home, I was talking about my own struggles with identity um, and how I struggle with feeling insecure. Um, and like my, my, my girl's eyes kind of lit up, like what mom, you struggle with feeling insecure. And, and I said, oh yeah. And, and here's how your dad helps me. Cause it was in the context that we were talking about who's helping us grow. And so I said, you know, your dad's helping me grow. And I shared a little bit about how would I feel insecure, um, their dad, my husband, reminds me of who I am in Christ. And and that's where their eyes kind of got big. And literally one of them said, Mom, you get insecure? And I said, Yeah, absolutely. And so it was it was my opportunity over, you know, leftover hamburgers last night at home to talk about my own journey with identity. And so, you know, I would say the same uh, as a family is being reformed. Uh, for us as adults, parents, step parents, t- to to volunteer, to be the first one to go in the deep end, metaphorically with our kids, and say, you know what? Sometimes in the midst of this new situation, we're all trying to figure out where we belong, and and here's here's when I tend to feel like I most belong in our newly formed, reforming family. But here's when I sometimes struggle, um, and you know, let that be an open door to see if your young person is open to sharing about any struggles they might be having with feeling like they belong Mm -hmm. in, in this new form of family.
You know, that's pretty easy to do, really, when you think about it. As a, I, I went immediately to being a step parent because there's so many times you don't feel that you belong. And yeah. just to express that, not to do it in a way that you're trying to put guilt on the kids or yeah. anything negative, but just to say the feeling of belonging or not belonging is huge. Mm-hmm. And we yeah. need to wrestle with that. Mm-hmm. And and so that's an easy conversation to bring up because yeah. so many in blended families are feeling it, not just the kids. Yeah. Well, you know, Gail, as you were talking, I, I had a memory. I, I was probably, gosh, I was probably 11. My younger brother was probably nine. And um, I remember my mom and my stepdad who, uh, you know, all four, uh, all four of my parents growing up, my biological parents and my stepmom, stepdad, are phenomenal people, all love Jesus. Um, and I remember mom and Jim sitting Matt and my, my brother and I down and, and talking to us about how, uh, some of the joking that we were doing toward Jim was actually kind of hurting his feelings and Mm. making him feel like, you know, he wasn't really part of the family. And I think my brother and I, you know, we were being sarcastic nine and 11 or 10 and 12 year olds. And, I think in in some ways it was our attempt to make Jim feel like part of our family, um, and yet it was having the opposite effect. It was really hurtful to to my stepdad, and so I'm really glad that my mom and stepdad sat us down. I'm also glad they did it together mm-hmm. um, because it was you know both the mom who we've known our whole lives as well as this new adult who we're learning to love sharing about, you know, belonging in our family and how what I was doing and my brother and I were doing was actually hurting my stepdad's sense of belonging. So so I do think, um, you know, we as as parents, step parents, there are those opportunities to share ways that our family, our new family is creating a sense of identity, belonging and purpose, or maybe where there are some struggles or points of tension. Mm. Well, it's a good story, and I know you're capitalizing, Gayla, on the whole boundary <laughs> setting there, and we've talked about that a lot um, in that illustration. And I also want to just jump in and say, uh, I know it seems sort of weird to go vulnerable if you're the step parent, yeah, because it feels like Ooh, I'm sort of setting myself up, and isn't that risky? And yes, yeah. it is. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, when you say. Uh, this is who I'm going to be, and I'm going to share this part of me with you. I think more often than not, it does facilitate bonding. It does say to the child, I, I, say to the child, I think what the child perceives is that, ah, oh, I can trust you. Mm-hmm. You're not yeah. trying to be, you know, all that in a bag of chips. You're you're just a regular person like me. Yeah, That actually helps a child, I think, open up towards, mm-hmm. and it certainly did for you, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you were talking, Ron, I was thinking about a principle that I use in general when it comes to conversations that could be tricky with a young person. Um, And it's a a phrase that actually comes from um, fruit tree picking, which you can tell just by the way I said that, that I don't know a lot about (laughs) what's involved in fruit tree picking. But I I do know this, Uh, you know, we happen to have an orange tree in our backyard. um, And, you know, when the oranges are starting to get ripe, we, we give a gentle tug. That's the phrase, gentle tug. And if that orange is ripe when we give that gentle tug, then the orange comes into our hands freely. Now, if the orange is not yet ripe, then it's it's more of a battle. And and I think the same is true probably in relationships in, in general and certainly in relationships with our children or our stepchildren. You know, if there's a if there's a tough conversation that we want to have, then, then maybe maybe we we ask a first question, we share vulnerably, and see how our our child or our stepchild responds. Do they you know do they walk with us as as we're sharing vulnerably, or are they not yet ready for that? So you know, I think my mom and stepdad they gave a gentle tug by sharing how Jim was feeling a little left out by the joking my brother and I were doing. And at least my recollection is we responded and said, wow, okay, thanks for telling us. Sorry. Um, in a 10 and 12 year old type way. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that was us being open. I'm sure there were other circumstances where we wouldn't have been open or maybe weren't open to that gentle tug. So I think there's ways to, you know, ask a first question, put her toe in the, put her toe in the water and see how that young person responds. 
Okay, so I'm pulling back from this conversation and I'm going, okay, if you're listening right now, the point is your kids are asking some big questions. And anytime you can step into the middle of that and and offer uh, some guidance or just connect with them around those questions, I think you're moving your heart closer to them. And maybe you're the biological parent, maybe you're the step parent, but we're helping them wrestle with the questions and begin to, how would you say it, Carol? We're helping them move further down the road to finding their own answers. Yeah, and finding Jesus's answers, and okay. and that's what was so fascinating in our research is, especially when we spent time with these twenty seven diverse teenagers, many of whom were from blended families, um, and we we identified what are they currently using to answer those questions. Would that be Google? And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, for, I mean, me- mechanistically, yes, absolutely. But I mean, what are what are the internal narratives they're currently using okay. to find a sense of identity, belonging, and purpose? And and what would be better Jesus centered narratives that we can point young people to that ultimately satisfy? Because I believe Jesus's answers are the answers that ultimately satisfy. And so, you know, part of actually, I think a lot of discipleship is is more fully embracing Jesus's best answers to our identity, belonging, and purpose questions. And as parents and step-parents, caregivers, grandparents, you know, we have the opportunity to accompany young people and and try to nudge them toward those better answers. Mm. Okay, so give us a quick contrast. Finding my own answers or finding Jesus' answers, what does that look like? And, And again, you know, how might a parent just play a role in helping a child with that? Yeah. Well, let's, we've been talking about belonging, so let's move to a different one of the questions. Let's mm-hmm. move to identity. So, um, you know, who am I? What we saw as we spent time with young people is there. there's two primary dominant answers right now that they use currently. Um, first off, they define themselves based on other people's expectations. So who, who am I? I am what my family expects, my teachers expect, my friends expect, my boss expects, my church expects, etc. And so they have all these different theaters of action. Um, And then the second answer that they tend to use, and it's closely related to the first, because of all these different sets of expectations, they end up feeling inadequate. They end up feeling like they're not enough. Um, And so, you know, the typical young person is walking around feeling like they're not smart enough, they're not pretty enough, they're not popular enough. We spent quite a bit of time with young people of color Um, And those young people often don't feel Latino enough, Black enough, Asian enough as they're navigating multiple worlds. And and so that, you know, creates uh, just an ongoing sense of inadequacy, stress, anxiety for young people. And so then let's contrast that with what I think is uh, Jesus's best answer to who we are. And, And I mean, there's There's 50 different answers, at least, that we could glean from Scripture about who God says we are. But one that we think is really important for young people to know today is that Jesus makes them enough. In the midst of trying to satisfy all these expectations and and feeling like they don't cross that bar, uh, you know, the word simple, the single word enough, that Jesus makes you enough. In fact, Jesus makes you more than enough. Um, that's the narrative that we want young people to to grasp onto. And so, I, and let me just say, I mean, again, I, I, over burgers last night with my husband and and daughters, um, I shared with them how I, I I'm learning that Jesus makes me enough. I'm learning to hold on to that. Um, and and you know, I I told my girls that what's interesting for me is it's not so much in my leadership role that I struggle with feeling insecure, struggle with my identity. It's actually in my role as a mom that I feel Mm -hmm. like I'm not enough. And, you know, once again, their eyes got big Mm -hmm. uh, to hear mom talk about, you know, how I even struggle with with being a mom. And I compare myself to other moms or I feel like there's things I could handle better and and I, I feel inadequate because of that. Um, and so, you know, when I, I pray 10 prayers for myself, and one of them is that I will know that Jesus makes me enough. So again, mm-hmm. these are these are lessons we continue to learn, and they're especially salient for our young people. I, I just love the way you're leading by talking about yourself. I, it disarms 
people. By the way, this works in friendships too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And this is what helped make makes the church the church is when we're willing to courageously step out in front and say, yeah, I got some struggles and some difficulties and this is me. Somebody else will follow that. But when we do that with our kids, I just love that image of your daughters, their eyes getting big, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mom does this. Mom does that. You're a real she's person. Got, she's yeah, got a <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's got initials behind her name. Therefore, there's nothing wrong. You know, yeah. uh, you know, my parent makes a lot of money. My parent does this and has accomplished that. I mean, that's really confusing to kids. And if they're, yeah. you know, I totally just got it. Like the light just went on for me. If they are saying, "I've got to meet the expectations of everybody," and I look at you, parent or whoever that is, well, you've met those expectations mm-hmm. as far as I can yeah. tell. Therefore, yeah. you don't have any concerns about yourself. Yeah. But when you say, "Yes, I do. This is me. This is my journey." Wow, instantaneously, it's like it centers them in you. It disarms them. And I I think they're really tuning in and listening now. Because generally, we do give an appearance that we have it together for the sake of our kids. Mm -hmm. We don't want to show the vulnerable side off all the time. And so, yes, they're going to see us in Mm -hmm. a light of, well, she has it together. Really? She feels insecure at times? How shocking. Yeah. And it must then turn for, to them to think, okay, well, then it's okay that I feel insecure also. It's a normal feeling. Okay. Well, let's let's turn the corner just a little bit as we continue to even process uh, what it looks like to help our children with, with these three big questions. What about the complexities that some blended families face? So let me just paint a scenario. You're working really hard at these. You just bought Kara's book, and you've read it frontwards and backwards. And you're going, ah, we're putting these principles into place. And it's sort of like you just also know that they have a day experience in your home and a night experience in the other home. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're like, what do we do about that? Let's just sort of process that out loud. Carrie, you got an immediate thought? Yeah, well, somewhat. Um, I I think that's super complicated. And, you know, as I've shared, while I was a daughter of divorce, my parents had um, pretty similar value systems and and, uh, were both Jesus followers. And so I I never experienced, you know, dramatic incontinuity between my parents my the two homes I visited. Although my dad let us have frosted flakes and my mom didn't let us have sugared cereal. You know, so there were those <laughs> kinds of differences. But, so I do remember that vividly, uh, enjoying the frosted flakes at one home. Um, but, you know, that wasn't necessarily core parenting style, so to yes, speak. Yes. Uh, you know, I think this is where ideally, and, and I'm going to speak uh, with a bit of naivete um, because I haven't been in the situation, but, but this is where... You know, the more that we can communicate with the other parents, presumably our former spouse or whoever, you know, the the other biological parent, and try to get on the same page with what the goals what the goals are. Um, I mean, that's better for the kids. There's there's quite a bit of research that shows the more consistency there can be, that is better for the kids. Um, and so, you know, I think it starts adult to adult mm-hmm. talking about how are we going to handle certain things? What do we want for our child when it comes to their identity, belonging, and purpose? And let's try to get on the same page. Um, again, it's it's all for the good of the kid. That's primarily what's motivating us. But but again, I'm somewhat naive in this, having not gone through this. So, you know, Ron or Gayla, I'm curious what you would say. Well, I agree. I think if we keep the long-range focus, for one, that can always help us. Mm-hmm. We are raising young adults. Are we serving them to be able to step into the world and be creative and purposeful adults? And sometimes that can just keep our mind, get our mind set. Mm-hmm. In a better frame. Yeah. So let's just stay with, um, let's think about the triangle for a minute, right? You, your co-parent in the other household, and the children. Yeah. And so far, we're looking at one side of it, the co-parent side of it. Um, Gayla, we've talked around this quite a bit, and we've done a number of podcasts on really difficult co-parent relationships. And I think for most people, you can have that reasonable conversation with the other household about what you would like to see a little bit different, or here's a value that we are trying to teach at our house, would you be willing to back that at your house? It's often the outliers mm-hmm. that have so many yeah. difficulties with things like this, the really yeah. extreme situations where they don't 
they don't care a bit about what you value or want or think is right. And so you're just getting a big fat no. We've always said around here, it's worth having that conversation again. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate what Kara suggests. It's worth trying again because you're always, you know, who knows what the Holy Spirit does in somebody's life between yeah. the last time you have attempted. And mm -hmm. so it's always worth making that soft approach. But if you continue to get a big fat no, then I think what you do is you pull back and you say, okay, uh, we've got to do what we can do. We've got to be intentional. We're going to continue down this path, teaching and supporting and talking and listening. And we know that the child is going to have sort of this bipolar experience of their households and the messages they receive about faith and all of that and truth. And it is what it is, and we've got yeah. to continue to teach as best we can. Uh, Kara, one thing I'll toss your way just to sort of get you to react to this is for years, we've sort of talked about this as a, look, we all send our kids into the world at some point. It's called, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a smartphone today, right? Yeah. It's it's yeah. social media. It's walking yeah. into school with people who have tons of worldly values, sending yeah. our kids over to another kid's house. We think they're good people, but we really don't know. Sure. We all do that, right? The world yeah. is always present. Sometimes the world just also happens to be their other parent their other yeah. household. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just sort of a little bit of the world there, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's a whole lot of the world there. So on one level, inoculating our children with what they need so that they can enter the world, whatever that looks like, dad's house, mom's house, or my friend's house, or, you know, yeah. school, it's, it's really the same process. Yes? I think that's such a good point, Ron. And you know, as you were talking, I was thinking anecdotally. I try to make I try to make it clear when I have research backing and when I just have anecdotal backing. As a youth pastor, um, especially, you know, I think about the teenagers I've talked to, um, how hard it was for them when one parent was critical of the other parent in front of them. Um, and how that puts them just in this uncomfortable um, middle ground that creates a lot of dissonance for them. So I think when it comes to identity, belonging, and purpose, again, these three big questions that change every teenager, uh, I think what I, would, what I would try to do if I was in the kind of co-parenting situation that you're talking about is, is talk about what Jesus is showing me about identity, my own identity, my belonging, my purpose, without being critical of mm -hmm. the other parent, um, and so I'm not trying to, you know, overtly critique that other approach. I just want you to understand what Jesus is showing me and why I have found this answer better than any other. Because um, I think if we can talk about, you know, other ways that we've tried to find our sense of identity, belonging, and purpose that haven't worked like Jesus has, then I think that's more powerful than us criticizing say, you know, the, the co-parent for, for their strategy or, or what they seem to be saying or doing or not saying or doing. Um, so I, again, I think the more that we can share our own narrative, our own journey, and how that, how that has strengthened our faith convictions, I think the better it is for our kids. Yeah, I think even when the, the other household is living in what we would say is a sin situation for us to just be overt about that is just going to throw mud in our face. I mean, mm. that is not going to uh, do justice for us. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying is it's okay to, we want to talk about it. We want our kids to understand clearly this is what scripture says, but we have to be very careful in how we're approaching that with mm -hmm. what possibly is going on in the other home. Yeah. So don't throw the other parent under the bus in an, any overt critical fashion. I think it's important that the listener realize that it does still put your child in the middle. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way around that. But yeah. what is different here is the soft and gentle presentation of the gospel, if I could say it that way, versus the hard and ugly, mm -hmm. judgmental, uh, we got it right, they've got it all wrong, you choose us, don't choose them sort of presentation of the gospel, which ironically is not the gospel, right? <laughs> so you just shoot yourself in the foot around whatever it is you're trying to teach. But as Kara was talking you know, it's it's that soft and gentle thing, Gayla, that really, I think, moves kids towards your heart. They know you're basically saying dad's choice or his lifestyle or the fact that he allows us to watch these shows and those shows that, we, you know, we can't watch over here 
is a statement about dad's values, but you're not saying dad's a horrible person. Right. You shouldn't li- love him or like him. Yeah. You're just saying this is what Jesus – I love the wording. This is what Jesus is showing us. This is how we're learning to walk with him. And there's reward here. There's benefit here. And, you know, we, you know, we, we want you to be able to experience that as well. And also understand that when kids live in two homes, they are going to see things that are different. They they are going to be affected by the values in that other home in ways that you cannot control. Mm -hmm. And that is when, for us, we turned to prayer Mm -hmm. and -hmm. just absolutely asking the Holy Spirit to be a part of what our kids were learning and help them grasp the truth that we were trying to teach as Mm -hmm. opposed to maybe other things that they were being exposed to. Love that, Gayla. You know, it, 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 just as you were talking about turning to prayer, I had another thought. Your thought is more spiritual than mine, but I, <laughs> I but I had another thought I'll share anyway. And that is, and this is just such a theme in our research, is uh, the power of other adults. Yes. Um, you know, parenting is not a solo sport. Even if you're single parenting, it's not a solo sport. It's a team sport. It's a group project. And so, you know, I, I get asked, so often by single parents or blended families, you know, what can we do about this? Because the other family is doing something, you know, the other parent is doing something different, whatever it might be. And, you know, I'm often pointing to, well, who are the other adults who are in your child's life, who are reinforcing um, the godly messages that you're trying to impart? Because, um, you know, sometimes our kids hear something better and more clearly from another adult than even us as a parent. And so, you know, this is where I think church can be so powerful, small group leaders can be so important, pastors, you know, that 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 70-year-old that your your kid just gravitates toward uh, after church. This is where extended family can be so meaningful, neighbors, you know, we we're, we just see this over and over again in our research, how important it is for kids to be surrounded by a team of adults who can also point them to Jesus's best answers to their identity, belonging, and purpose questions. Mm. Wow. That's a game changer. As I'm thinking about that, I'm, you said the word surrounded by. Well, th- our kids are going to be surrounded by a lot of things. They're surrounded by Google. They're surrounded by um, you know, social movements that are teaching truth that is not God's truth, completely enveloped by all of those things. The more people that are bringing a godly influence to your kids and reinforcing the things that you're trying to teach them while they're in your home, yeah, wow, that just strengthens that whole thing. And it's sort of, here's the interesting thing, it takes it away from the mom versus dad mm-hmm. discussion. It moves it back into the realm of the church, the understanding, the, the uh, lots of people who love you and are deeply invested in your life. They live and believe and teach and talk the same things. That's a game changer. Now, I know for people listening, they're thinking, well, how do I find that community? Gayla, I know that's— Well, yeah, and it doesn't even have to be within the church, although we were— always keeping our kids a part of youth ministry. Mm. But I had a youth minister tell me just what you're saying, Kara, that our teenagers need five adults highly invested in their lives when Mm. they're teenagers. And it might be a coach. In the case of our boys who played sports, if we saw a coach that we could tell probably was a Christian, we began having conversations with him so that he knew that he could have those conversations with our sons. So it's, it's wherever you can find those people that are willing to invest in your kids' lives. And this is also where it's so important to know the parents of your kids' friends, Mm, if at all possible. And then you can help guide them towards those who you know when they're in their home, they're having good conversation that you want them to have. Kara, we talked about social media just a minute ago. Do you got any general thoughts that you would share with our listeners about about the role of social media in their kids' lives and managing uh, smartphone and connectivity to what's going on in the world around them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, first, I'll say that uh, there's a lot of good that comes from technology and social media. In fact, especially 
in the midst of the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of young people, somewhere around 70% of young people felt like technology helped them stay connected to important relationships. And I'm guessing, you know, perhaps you two, I know I did, many of your listeners saw this, that, you know, kids were able to stay in touch with that mentor, that small group leader. Kids were able to reach out to important friends, uh, technology, et cetera. So there's something really powerful about creating a sense of belonging through technology. Um, I think some of the challenges, though, are that technology creates ideals. Social media creates ideals that are unattainable. Um, it shows us all, you know, what everybody else is doing that seems better than what we're doing at that moment. <laughs> so, you know, I, I graduated from high school in the late 80s. And if I wasn't invited to a Friday night party, I maybe heard about it on Monday morning. Right. Um, you know, for young people today, if they're not invited to a Friday party or, you know, out for for burritos or whatever it might be, like they see that event unfolding on the device in their hand. Um, and so, you know, this is where I think it's important to also mental, mention mental health for young people. Um, while there's a, a myriad of factors that are involved in, you know, this escalation we're seeing of mental health challenges, anxiety, depression, suicidal tendencies in young people, um, it, it's pretty hard to escape the way those mental health challenges have increased as young people have had more access to technology, have seen more of what they're missing out on, become even more aware of all the problems in the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we as parents, um, this is not an area that we can hit cruise control in. You know, we, I, I, I will say this is probably, especially when our kids were 12, 13, 14, uh, every, I think at least once a week, Dave and I were asking each other, okay, how do we sp respond to X, whatever it is, X. And that would usually have to do with something our kids were doing with technology. Um, and so, you know, it, in fact, I was just reading some research today that talked about how important it is as parents to actually follow uh, particular apps guidelines for age usage. So the typical social media app, you're not supposed to join until you're 13. Um, so if your 10, 11, 12 year old is on particular social media platforms, they or you have lied in order to join that platform. And so, you know, we at the Fully Thin Suit, that's kind of our, our, starting, our starting baseline is Let's teach our kids to obey rules, <laughs> not to lie about their birth dates, and not to join some of those platforms until they're of the age that the platform allows. Um, so, you know, that's one thing. Second thing I would say, uh, I kind of hinted at this already, but just close monitoring. Our kids knew that, um, that we, we could look at their phones at any time. Um, I love families that make that a mutual practice where, you know, a, a kid parents can also need it look too. at a parent. Exactly. A kid yeah. can look at a parent's phone. They, they all exchange phones and look at each other's uh, social media accounts and texts, et cetera. So, so, you know, I would say those are two important guidelines. Stick with the age minimums that apps require. And then secondly, make it at your household policy that we're going to be able to check at your phone at any time. Love it. So, Kara, one of the things that I read that you have said is it's not doubt that is toxic to faith. It's silence. Yep. And I love that, especially with blended families or any of us who maybe at times feel insecure about how to address this issue. And, yeah. and so we just don't say anything, which is yeah. really can be very detrimental. Yeah, you know what? That was one of the big surprises, Gayla, in some of our previous research on sticky faith, how you help young people build a faith that lasts, is first off, 70% uh, of the youth group graduates that we surveyed had significant doubts about their faith. Um, and that could cause us to panic, but here's the good news. When those young people had the opportunity to express and explore their doubts, that was actually correlated with greater faith maturity. Put more simply, um, doubt isn't toxic to faith. Silence is toxic to faith. And so, you know, this is a question for us as parents, step parents, to think about, you know, how do we help our homes be safe places where mm -hmm. we can ask questions about God? 
Um, for us, you know, uh, in fact, just this summer, our youngest is in 10th grade and, and we have a practice with our kids that the summer after their 10th grade year, we actually go through a resource that the Full Youth Institute created called Can I Ask That? Um, which looks at a handful of young people's biggest questions about God and life, questions about suffering, questions about different um, moral choices, et cetera. And so with our oldest two and now with our youngest, we go through that because we think, uh, you know, the, the questions are particularly appropriate for that 10th, 11th grader. And so, you know, I'll be taking my daughter out to a lot of acai bowls. She's a big fruit smoothie girl. Uh, my son, <laughs> my, with my son, it was burgers. But with this daughter, I think it's going to be, you know, a, a handful of smoothies over the course of the summer <laughs> where we're going to go through some of those questions. Um, so, you know, whether it's the way that you as a parent or step parent take advantage of what's happening in the world, you know, why would God allow uh, the conflict that we're seeing in Ukraine. I mean, that's that's a that's an important question to think through with our kids. Um, or whether it's through using a curriculum like Can I Ask That for us to have our homes be safe places to ask those questions about God. And let me just say one last thing. You know, I have a PhD in practical theology and my 16-year-old can stump me with her questions about God. <laughs> wow. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, we don't have to have all the answers. We can't have all the answers. Right. If we could fully explain God, then God would not be God. God would just exactly. be kind of a cool person. Mm -hmm. So there are elements of God that we cannot explain, which is part of what makes God God. And so a phrase that I have found so helpful is, I don't know, but, four words, I don't know, but. So when your kid asks you, not, I'm not I said when, not if, when your kid asks you a tough questions about God, you know, I don't know, but here's what I have found to be true about God. Or I don't know, but you know what? I know a woman at our church who loves questions like that. Let's, let's get together with her for coffee and talk about it. Or I don't know, but how about if we grab our Bibles and go out, go out for ice cream and, and look at together at what scripture has to say. That phrase, I don't know, but it keeps the conversation going and it helps you share personally about what God is teaching you, even if you can't answer all the big questions. Yeah, I love that. And just how important it is for our kids to be asking those questions of us, yeah. not somebody else that we don't know what answers they're getting. And we want to encourage that in our home. Hmm. Kara, I've got uh, one more question for you. I I'm just confident that we have some people listening right now that have at least one teenager or young adult who has deconstructed their faith in some form or fashion. Um, you got a few do's and don'ts or a word of encouragement, what would you say to those parents? You've been listening to my conversation with Gayla Grace and Kara Powell. I'm Ron Deal, and this is Family Life Blended. Kids who have deconstructed their faith are really common these days. We'll hear Kara's response to my question in just a few minutes. Let me remind you that this September we have a matching gift opportunity. It's just around the corner. Everything you donate will be doubled by a matching gift. Would you be praying about how you might be a part of that beginning September 1st and ending on National Step Family Day, September 16th? If you'd like more information about my guest, you'll find it in our show notes, or you can just look on the Family Life Blended podcast page at familylife.com slash blended podcast. And uh, while you're there, make sure you check out everything Family Life and our division, Family Life Blended, has for you and your family. Hey, if you don't mind, give us a quick review. We really appreciate that. That helps other people find us. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you can certainly do that on your favorite podcast app. Just a quick reminder that our summit on step family ministry is just around the corner. It's going to... Yeah. Another quick reminder that our Summit on Step Family Ministry is coming up October 13 to 14, 2022. We would love for you or a representative, a pastor or somebody from your church to be there. Our theme this year is Reveal Grace and Loss in Blended Families. Come learn how you or your church can prevent redivorce 
and strengthen step families in your congregation and your local community. Visit summitonstepfamilies.com for all the details. That's summitonstepfamilies.com, or just look in the show notes for a link. So I asked Kara what parents can do if their child is moving away from God in their faith. Here's her answer. Unconditional love wins the day. Um, So the more that we can stay true to what we believe, absolutely, and continue to unconditionally love the young people who are important to us, um, that that's ultimately, you know, as we look at um, what God uses to draw people back, draw young people back uh, to faith. Um, I, we haven't actually done research on this. So again, I'm speaking anecdotally. The two things that I would say tend to, tend to be the most common are, number one, God uses a person. God uses an adult. It could be us as a parent or step-parent. It could be someone, you know, a roommate at college. It could be their new boss when they're 24, you know, whatever it might be. Um, in fact, my, my son just started a new job, um, and I'm praying a lot for the people he meets at his job, that God would surround him with people who are going to keep pointing Nathan to him. And so, you know, number one, it's the kind of relationships we continue to develop and that other people tend to develop with our kids. And then number two, and this is tough as a parent, um, is suffering, suffering, that it's often the hard seasons that our kids or our stepkids go through that God uses to draw that young person back into relationship. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, <laughs> in a moment of transparency, I, I don't think I've ever said this on an interview before, but, uh, you know, Dave and I, we, we so desperately want our kids to keep growing in Jesus that, that I have prayed maybe my most scary prayer as a parent, and that is, um, you know, whatever it takes to keep our kids close to you, Jesus, that's what we want. Um, and as much as I would love my kids to have a life of, you know, sweetness and light and pure joy all the time, what I ultimately want more than anything else is that they would keep growing in Jesus. Um, and Romans 5 Paul writes that suffering leads to perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And so, you know, for young, our young people who are drifting from the faith, there's no magic formula, but it's often relationships, often suffering, often when the two go together, the relationships we maintain during a young person's time of suffering that God uses as that magnet to draw young people back. So, Again, that's not from research, but just what I've tended to see in families and youth ministries around the country. Next time, you're going to hear my conversation with Dave and Ann Wilson about our new online course called Well Blended. That's Dave and Ann Wilson next time on Family Life Blended. I'm Ron Deal. Thanks for listening. And thanks to our monthly donors who make this podcast possible. If you'd like to join our Family Life Partner Program or just simply say thank you for what we're doing and how it's serving your family, look in the show notes for a link. We value and appreciate every dollar that's given. Our producer is Marcus Holt, mastering engineer Jarrett Roski, project coordinator Ann and Caro, and theme music composed and performed by Braden Deal. Family Life Blended is part of the Family Life Podcast Network, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.